you ought to live in a perpetual high. You ought to live in a perpetual drunk. I don't mean people having to carry out a church, and I'm all for that. But sooner or later, you've got to wake up and go to work. To be drunk in the spirit means to be endued, supplied, intoxicated to the degree you think like, act like, talk like, and live like him. Amen. Man, I'm glad you're here tonight. It, it's, I was sharing with Pastor Dale and Colleen. It, it's an honor the last few years to get to be a part of WordFest and, and uh, just share my heart and... Uh, pastor asked me something that I, I was raised in church in the ministry and I've seen both sides of the pulpit and one of the things that turned me off matter of fact when God called me to preach I asked him three things I said number one give me a message that will challenge the people even if that makes them break their tradition right. number two I don't want to go broke doing this and number three, if you ever call me to pastor, let it be in Hawaii. So, as the old song says, two out of three ain't bad so far. <laughs> Amen. I may feel some Hawaii coming on. But, you know, I, I, I've seen offerings abused. Amen. We have covenant partners in the ministry. I had a, a minister just last week tell me, you never mention anything about covenant partnership. I've seen, I said, I've seen it abused. We don't fleece people when we leave. I learned a long time ago, people's not my source. God is my source. And you don't give because I need it. You give because you do. Amen. And I mean, hey, you become a hilarious giver then. Amen. And, and so a lot of times people, people uh, when they hear offering, they, oh, it's the money thing. But understand this. If offering offends you, it's because money is your God. I mean, that's very simple. And so uh, one of the greatest compliments was pastor asked me before service, would you receive the offering tonight? And I appreciate the trust of that because I don't abuse it. I just tell you, you're blessed by doing it. Amen. Well, what is an offering? In, it, it, well, it's got to be a sacrifice before it's blessed. Okay, it's got to be somebody say sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? Anything you were going to use on you. It's not a sacrifice till you feel it leave. How many believes Jesus was a sacrifice? Did he suffer doing it? Oh, yes, he did. I mean, your mind's telling you what in the world. I know, I know emphatically after all these years, I know I did what God told me to do whenever I give an offering because right afterward the flesh says, what in the world were you thinking? <laughs> Amen. I want to show you something in the scripture. Uh, Philippians, the fourth chapter, and I'm not going to take long doing this. Uh, if you need an envelope for your giving, because it, even if you're giving cash, which... When God speaks to me, I never have enough cash on me. I always have to write a check. So if you're writing a check, you won't need an envelope. But if you're giving cash, uh, just raise your hand. The ushers will give you one. Uh, the church wants to be able to receipt you for your giving. And uh, so if you need an envelope, just raise your hand. Everybody at Philippians, the fourth chapter, say amen. amen. Oh, okay. So you're just waiting on me. Philippians, the fourth chapter. The 19th verse, now that you've turned to it, look up at me because I bet you can finish it for me. And my God, there you go. Well, why'd you have me turn to it if I can quote it? Well, because the problem is, like most things we've done in our church life, we've taken scripture out of context. We never really go back and read why. You need to be a student of the word. And my God shall supply all your. Your is a personal pronoun in the English structure of language. So your specifies a group of people among others. So let's go back. Are you teachable? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back 
uh, to the 10th verse, Paul said, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that now at, at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know it's going to be all right. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians, now do you know who the your is in the 19th verse? And my God shall supply all your. He wasn't talking to the Christians at Corinth. He wasn't talking to the Christians at Rome. He was talking to the Philippian Christians. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me. Corinth didn't. The Roman church didn't. What's this? The church at Ephesus didn't. No church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again. In other words, he went to church and the people didn't support the ministry of the, of the, of the kingdom. And that's getting quiet because all y'all got stuck on my God shall supply all my needs. We're just finding out who the my is. Who the your is. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What's he saying? He's saying, I don't need your money. I need you to be blessed because health and prosperity are the representatives of your witness on the earth. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ephroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable, there it is, somebody say sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your need. See, we have believers quoting that, my God shall supply all my need, but if you're not using your monies as a sacrifice to further the gospel you have exempt yourself from the promise oh aren't you glad I'm not preaching on money tonight but see people's just saying it people who never given the offering are still saying my God shall supply all your need hear me it's not God that can't bless you you are not aligning yourself in an open heaven to be blessed I don't care if you got to tear a button off your shirt if you don't have any money. You put something you're going to miss in the plate. I dare you. You watch your God. Well, Mark, I've given and given, and I'm not walking in abundance. But have you sacrificially given? Anytime you talk about money or sex in church, everybody gets quiet. Well, I have nothing to do with either one of them. Amen. <laughs> Hear me. How many believes God wants you blessed? How many believes he will supply all your need? Amen. But did you just see that? The ink's dry. I didn't write it. Paul said, you guys, I went and preached at a church in Corinth, and those stingy people didn't give anything to further the gospel. He said, either way, I'm going to be okay. I've learned to be abased and to abound, and I know I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength, but I'm trying to get you blessed. I don't want you to just be a survivor by giving what you can. Well, Mark, God will never ask me to give what I, what I can't. What I can't give, what I don't have. God will never ask me to give what I don't have. Nope. But he will ask you to give what you don't want to. Do we serve the same God? Because he's always doing that stuff to me. I remember I had a little fun going for a Harley. It wasn't anything that was robbing my family of necessities. But it's just, 
I mean, we call it motorcycle fun. My, my youngest boy, Parker, he'll do it. We'll walk out of a store somewhere, and he's looking on the ground. Man, if there's a penny there, a dime there, I've got jugs and jugs of change I was building up. Spirit of the Lord spoke to me one day. He said, uh, I had just heard of a family that they were some months behind on their mortgage, their utilities. They had kids about to lose it all. The man did work. I don't feel sorry for people who feel sorry for themselves. But I have no problem helping people who are trying. We walked out of the downtown post office today in Tulsa. Parker was with me, my little one. And one of the people were sitting there on the street. And I've given the man money. That's fine. I've given, I, over the years, I've given him money. Same guy sitting there. Parker said, as we walked by, he said, Dad, I pray at night that that guy won't be poor no more. I said, son, it's all right. He's poor by choice. He don't want to work. People either don't want to work or they don't know how to budget. That's the reason they voted for a bailout. How did I get off in politics off of that? Amen. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? But God wants to supply your need. He's already done it. You're tapping into it. Hello. Psalm 84 says he has withheld no good thing from them that walk uprightly. So if I've already been blessed with everything that pertains to life and godliness, what is the key to tapping into it? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So I encourage you, bless yourselves. I, like Paul, would say, I'm going to be all right. But bless yourselves. Father, I set the anointing of the church of Philippi upon this house tonight. That they can begin as a church body. It's not a one night offering. Father, this corporate body, whatever church they attend, is going to begin to give sacrificially above their tithe and their offering. And they're going to tap into Philippians 4.19 and not just quote it as a scripture, but live it as a lifestyle that every need is supplied. And we declare it done. And somebody said amen. amen. Well, thank you, Pastor, for letting me do that. Your tithe and your 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 tithe goes to your uh, church, amen. I was at a word church. Uh, everybody's supposed to have a word church, but word of faith church up in another state. And the pastor asked me on a Sunday morning. He said, "Would you receive our tithe and offering?" I said, "Man, I'd love to." Now this is a word of faith church. No. This is a church that knows the word. And I said, how many's got your tithe and offering ready? Woo, woo. <laughs> how many gave your tenth? Woo. How many included your offering? You could have heard a mouse crawl on that carpet. Can, can, can I say this? This will help you. Have you ever wondered why the word says bring all your tithe and your offerings into the storehouse and prove me now And this, says the Lord, if I will not open you, not open for you. We've misquoted that. You are the window of heaven. A window is an opportunity. He said, I'll give you opportunity after opportunity so you'll walk in such blessing you don't have room enough to contain it. Isn't that what the word says? But the Bible also says my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Jesus said it's these little foxes that spoil the vine. Do you realize most of those people did not know that they are supposed to attach their tithe and their offering together? If you make, uh, this is hypothetical, whatever, I'm just going to throw a figure. How much is a tithe? 10%. In the Hebrew, it's a tenth. Okay? So if you got a... Uh, $700 paycheck this week, how much is your tithe? $70. But in the scripture, in the book of Numbers, the word says, and your offering is a tenth of the tithe. So when the word says, bring your tithe and your offerings, how much is your tithe? 
70 how much is your offering so Sunday my tithe and offering is 77 dollars it will open your world up and then of course first fruit many people don't understand first fruit man I got off on money he's thinking boy I shouldn't ask him to take up the offering but hey money's the number one reason for divorce the love of money is the root of all evil. So don't be afraid to talk about money. You don't need to pray for a blessing. You need to pray for understanding a principle. There's a series out there on money matters. It teaches you what the first fruit offering. If you watch a lot of Christian television, you'll think the first fruit offering is $777 during a telethon year. No. Just because people's on TV doesn't mean they're smart in the word. You can have money and still not be smart. A first fruit offering is 100% of your first seven day increase once a year. Did you turn me down? See, you start off your year. I, I know my family. We start off every year. One, we never know what we make from week to week. We never know. But we take 100%. At the end of January, we calculate what we made in a seven-day period. The first seven days of January, we give 100% of that week back into God. And I can stand here and tell you, no matter what the economy does, every year, ask the CPA we use. Every year, it increases. It'll blow you away. Well, I'm going to preach on the rapture tonight. Amen. <laughs> so, ushers, if you're, if you're ready, are you ready? All right. I want you to come. Are you ready to give tonight? Thank you, Lord. While they're receiving the offering, I, I have promised I won't hold you long, and, and I won't. Uh, I learned I have a lot of young ministers getting started in the ministry well what do I need to know and one of the first things you tell them is the people's ear is connected to their rear you can't out preach what they're able to stay awake through some of my best revelation has been slept through because I preached too long that was years ago no more so we cut the chase get straight to the point People say, boy, that Mark Shell, he's really in your face with the word, isn't he? Yeah, I don't want to keep you here two hours. I want you to go home and have a little dinner and chill out for a while. Amen. Let, let's go ahead and go to the time. hear me now okay thank you all y'all for coming very much again don't forget the CDs on the table uh, there'll be someone to help you you can write a check for anything cash is good visa MasterCard uh, discover uh, get it in you I challenge you to get it in you uh, I've had so many people get hacked off at what I preach and they'll study what I preach and then they'll come back and say I saw it they'll say I, I saw it and so it, isn't it amazing usually the thing we get upset about is the thing God is trying to get into us go ahead yeah bring it to me I, I want to lay hands on that if you don't mind stretch your hands towards your giving father in these buckets represent time talent energy education and desires we call it sacrifice I release the anointing that raised Jesus that sacrifice from the dead upon this sacrifice and I call this harvest to live and everybody said I agree, I agree. amen I want you to open your Bibles please if you would to the book of Mark the 16th you know what let's start in Isaiah 65 
I left off there last night. Let's just pick it up again. Did you get something last night? Isaiah 65. Looking at the 17th verse, the word says, do I need to drop this down on my shirt some? Okay, because I'm squealing back to me. 17th verse, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Somebody say new heavens and a new earth. Now look at me just a minute. If you're wrapped up in the modern day eschatological teachings of there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, this is not what that's pertaining to. Amen. A new heaven is a heaven that is open and no longer closed. A new earth, a new earth is one that is the will of God is being done on it. Amen. A new heaven is an open heaven. A new earth is a receiving earth. Amen. All right. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. He said, when Jesus comes and pays the price, I'm going to raise up a new creature for a new heaven and a new earth that won't even remember not being like God. That's good news, isn't it? All right. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem. Somebody said, that's me. I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing. You are the New Testament Jerusalem. Yes, you are. Okay. You are the New Testament Jerusalem. I will rejoice in that creation of a Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her. When? When the heavens are open. Amen. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days. Nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die. Somebody say die. die. Now in the third heaven there is no death. So this is the heaven he opened on earth. Okay. Very important to understand. The child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For the days, for as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they're still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. Now, have you noticed a common thing here? He mentioned death. He mentioned the possibility of theft, but the inability to be theft against you. He mentioned there would be people that needed to be saved, and they would be saved. And now he's talking about the serpent still eating dust. So this is an open heaven Jesus created. This is the same open heaven that Jesus ministered in for three and a half years. This is not a heaven coming this is a heaven that can be experienced right now. This is a blessing that can be experienced right now. Amen. Say it with me. An open heaven is a rent veil. The finished work of Jesus. An open heaven is a holy God accepting man as holy. That's what it means in open heaven. So when you hear messages, there's going to be a new heaven you'll know they're dead wrong because the new heaven happened when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Amen. Let's go look at this. Mark the 16th chapter. Now how many wants to live in that open heaven? Amen. This, hear me. Jesus healed all the sick because of the open heaven. All the demons fled him because he lived in an open heaven. 
In Mark the 16th chapter, let me take this a step farther and just reiterate uh, into a new path how to live in and operate in that open heaven. Mark the 16th chapter, the 14th verse. Later, Jesus, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief. Why? Because unbelief is the only thing that can keep you out of the open heaven. Amen. Unbelief is the only thing. So he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart. What is the hardness of heart? The inability to change their mind. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. He wasn't talking about financially. He was talking about mentally. People who cannot grasp who they are in Christ, even though they're taught and they're taught and they're taught, Jesus referred to them as poor. He said, uh, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen, and he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, what? That the heavens are opened and is baptized. Somebody say baptized. That word means to be immersed into the Word. Some people teach unless you're baptized in water, you're not saved. That's erroneous indoctrination. The word baptized in this text means that you... Matter of fact, the connotation of the original definition means the making of a pickle. You take a cucumber, you boil it in water. The boiling of the water does not make it a pickle. It only prepares it for the vinegar. The vinegar is what makes it a pickle and brings a change about it. That's what this word baptized means. It means to immerse yourself into who he is until you believe that's who you are. So he who believes and is baptized will be saved, healed, delivered. In other words, operate in the blessings of Isaiah 65, 17, uh, starting the 17th verse of the open heaven. And he who does not believe that the heavens are open will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. Here's where I want to go. They will speak with new tongues. Mark, am I operating in an open heaven? I don't know. Do you speak with new tongues? Oh, yeah, listen to me. That's not what he's talking about. New tongues is different from other tongues. On the day of Pentecost, they began to speak with other tongues. The word new comes from the original Greek word, which means to speak from another quality. If you live in an open heaven, you don't even talk like you're unrighteous anymore. You don't even talk like you're, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You don't even talk like that anymore. When you have so baptized your mind in who he is and immersed yourself in the word of who he made you to be, Jesus came to open the heavens for you so you could walk in the blessings of Isaiah 65 right now. Well, Mark, don't you believe in the streets of gold and gates of pearl? Sure, but I'm just not ready to go. Hello, as far as I'm concerned, heaven can wait. Now it's getting more quiet and more quiet. Well, what about, there will be peace in the valley for me. Someday, don't smoke that dope. You, I don't care if Tennessee, Ernie Ford, or Moses sang it. That is not scriptural. Jesus said, my peace I give to you now. Not the peace the world gives, but my peace give I unto you. If I have to wait for peace for another day, it's because I don't believe what Jesus did. The heavens were open. I want to live in that open heaven, amen? And I think you do too, or you wouldn't be at a church service on a Friday night. I want to show you how to do it. You must learn how to speak with new tongues. Somebody say tongues. I wish that would have been translated differently. We use the English word tongue, but the original derivative of the Greek word means language. Now hear me. 
Language consists of your words, your mentality, or your lifestyle, and your attitude. Wait a minute. Your words, your lifestyle, and your attitude or your demeanor is your language. So he who believes and has immersed their mind in who I said they are, it will be proven in their words, their attitude, and their lifestyle. So it's not just, oh, look, I'm, I've got the Holy Ghost. Sigamo saya, combo si, supersize my big fry, come to Sonic and supersize it. No, 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 no. Mark, you're making fun of it. Yeah, I am. Because out of ignorance, people thought they could yabba dabba do to victory. You can't talk in tongues your way to victory. You've got to live it, you've got to talk it, and you've got to have the disposition to get through anything. I'll prove it to you in the Word. Go over to 1 John, the fifth chapter. Somebody say language. So never forget that, okay? When you see tongue, it means language, and language is comprised... You know, if hear me. If the only way I can win is speak to the mountain, I'm kind of up a creek if I'm a mute. I mean, doesn't that kind of make sense? Well, you got to tell that devil to go. What for the guy that... What, I mean, these are just, this is just logic. If a guy can't speak and he's a mute, and the only way the mountain's going to move is if he speaks to it, he's going to have to learn to live with a mountain. So we should have known from that it's more than just what you say. Because, see, in our circle of faith, a lot of people are just trained on, oh, when something goes wrong, you just declare, I'm blessed, healed, and highly favored. Well, that's fine. But unless you believe it, it ain't going to happen. You can talk positive all you want to, but until you believe what you say, you'll not have what you say. Amen. And, and so in, in 1 John 5, let me get over there. I'm not really a preacher, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. Uh, I forgot to turn over there. 1 John 5. The sixth verse, can you handle this tonight? Man, I want you, here, look at me before you get nosy at Snoop Dogg and start reading it. I'm just messing with you. What's this? I want you to live in a place where you never, ever have to ask God to heal you again. He answers before you call. I want you to live in a place you never sweat another bill again. Your need is always supplied before you even knew you had a need. That's not the sweet by and by. It happened when the heavens were open. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Well, Mark, I'm not living there. Well, then this is more than likely the problem. Okay? 1 John 5, 6 verse. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus, the Mashiach, the Christ. Not only by water. Somebody say water. Now you understand, y- y- y'all are students of the word. Water represents word. Blood represents life. Okay? By definition, it means kinship. So they overcame him by their relationship and the word of their testimony. Okay? Blood is not just the liquid flowing down. Blood is the relationship you have. Okay? And... It is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on the earth. Oh, wait a minute. Thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. Now, if those three witnesses cause manifestation of the heavens, what causes manifestation of the earth? Because he promised a new heaven and a new earth with the coming of Jesus. There are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. So in Mark 16, when he said this sign is going to follow them, they will speak with new tongues, what does he mean? Their language is going to agree. Their life 
will match their words and their words will match their mental disposition. Because, see, a lot of people, oh, how you doing? Well, I'm blessed and healed. Well, why don't you enter worship? Well, you know, nobody knows. Sing that one when we all get to heaven. Because I'm so sick, only dying would make me feel better. Now I'm making fun of it because we've been goofy. Amen. We, we really have. Did you just see that? What does it mean to speak with new tongues? It means the trifecta of man, the triad of man, which is comprised of the imagery of God, his language, his disposition, and his actions must all agree. And when your words, lifestyle, and attitude agree on earth as he agrees in heaven, whatsoever you pray, thy will be done, it will manifest in the earth. You, you hear me? Because we've got people, they talk a good game, but their mental disposition is not there. Their attitude stinketh. There's some King James for you. Their attitude is wrong. Their lifestyle is wrong. These three must agree. The blood, the life, the water, the word, and the spirit or the attitude, the mental disposition. They must agree. Are you with me? Okay, let's go back to Genesis. Now, anytime a preacher says, I'm not going to hold you long, turn to Genesis 1. Don't ever believe him, but tonight you can believe me. I won't hold you long. Tell your neighbor, image is everything. Genesis, the first chapter, and you came teachable, right? Okay. Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th verse, then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God said, let us make man in our imagery. Now watch this. Man was made at that moment, but he did not appear on earth until the second chapter, the seventh verse. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God created you with his imagination. He formed you with his action. Oh, my God. You're wanting to just talk your miracle. You've got to form your miracle. All three parts of you must bear witness. Your attitude's got to line up with what you're saying. Don't just talk it. Start believing it. Don't just talk it. Start acting like it. Amen. There are so many people dying, good people, believers, Bible thumping, aisle running, carpet wiggling, tongue talking believers are dying with diseases like every other Tom, Dick, and Harry, and something's wrong. I don't believe a believer is ever supposed to die with a disease. Well, God needed to flower in his garden. Don't smoke that. He's not growing a garden needing you as a flower in it. He'll probably use you as fertilizer. Are you hearing me? He don't need a flower in his garden. He wants you to live. Hello. It's my last night. Amen. <laughs> All right. What, uh, you've got to see it. So God created man in his own image. In the imagery of God, he created him. Now it's going to start making a lot of sense. Image is everything. God could only form what he had imagined. 
You will only produce what you imagine. You are most like God when you are imagining. Now does it make sense in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, I think it is, for we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Imagination is your creative ability. Whatever a man imagines in his heart, that's what he becomes. Even God formed you by this process. We've got people trying to form things who can't even imagine it yet. Well, I'm believing for a healing, but have you imagined it? Well, I'm believing for a new house, but have you imagined it? Do, do you see this? I began to study imagination. This was very intriguing. These were some things that God showed me. Imagination is my creative ability. Imagination is the language of the Spirit. And they shall speak with new language. What is the new language when my imagination forms everything good by my words, my attitude, and my lifestyle? Imagination is a force that goes beyond what you've ever seen, heard, or experienced and pictures a possibility beyond facts. Have you ever heard of letting your imagination run wild? Isn't it sweet? I mean, we look at little children, their imaginations. What happens? We get older. We get older, and now... We try to facilitate a bright future based upon what we've sensed in the natural realm. Hello, well, diabetes has always been in my family. Heart disease has always been in my family. You know, when I go to the doctor, I just check off everything because it's there somewhere. <laughs> Amen. What happens? We've got, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about saved people who are walking in, an, in a limited imagination. Hear me. When your imagination is bearing witness, spirit, blood, and water, you are operating in an open heaven. If you don't control your tongue or your language, it takes you out of the open heaven. Amen. Amen. Imaginations are mental pictures based upon accusations, based upon words and thoughts. Imagination is a spiritual language that releases God's ability for man to be like him. I'll say it again. Your most God-likeness is not your lack of smoking, dipping, drinking, or buying lottery tickets. Your most God-likeness is your ability to imagine good in the midst of adversity. Amen. Imagination is man's closest similarity to God. Man, can you imagine yourself healthy? Can you imagine your whole household say? Well, let me, you don't have turn here, but... Let me ask you this, according to Isaiah 65, can you imagine peace? Can you imagine no sorrow? Can you imagine promises realized? Can you imagine a life where you're never stolen from again? A life of restoration? Can you imagine household salvation? A powerful spirit-led life in which you never walk in fear ever again? And God created man by imaging him, imagining him, and then he formed what he imagined by his word. All three bore witness. His attitude was, I want someone like me. So he dwelt upon that thought till he imagined it. And he imagined it as done, and he spoke it, and man was formed. Do you see how all three bear witness? Then why do we hop in prayer lines and try to skip the process? Oh, it's getting quiet. 
thank God for miracles that happen in prayer lines, but evidently something's going on if they're not all healed. I'm tired of preachers trying to excuse God's power. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of one believer being healed of cancer and another one dying and saying, I don't know why. He said, the only thing that can destroy God's people is a lack of knowledge. Hello. I can't live in an open heaven and be cursed. It's impossible. I don't know about you, but that's where I want to live, in an open heaven. No matter how many years I have on this planet, I want it to be an open heaven where it's testified of Mark. I never heard him to ask God for anything, but he walked in blessing after blessing after blessing. God manifested on the truth he walked in. And so I've got to bring my life into the existence of God. Let us make man in our image. What are you making in your imagery? Because if you make it in your imagery, believe me, you're going to start forming it with your words. You think sick long enough, you're going to start talking sick. You think diabetic long enough, you're going to start forming it with your words. It, are, are you with me? Okay, let me keep going. I, I, I studied this out and it was very intriguing to me. I hope uh, if you'll indulge me just a moment. I am not a psychologist, but uh, other people have been well studied in that realm. And, and so I, I want to I show you something here. Imagination, according to psychology, imagination, also called the faculty of imaging, is the ability of forming mental images, sensations, and concepts in a moment when they are not perceived through sight, hearing, or other senses. Imagination is the work of the mind that helps create fantasy. Imagination is your creative ability. You can talk a good game all day long. You can call yourself healed. You can yabba-dabba all the positive confession, and I'm all for it. Don't think I'm demeaning the, the necessity of it. But if all three don't bear witness, it's not going to happen. Most Bible colleges don't teach you this. They just teach you be positive. Be positive. It's more than just mind over matter. It's got to be word, lifestyle, lifestyle, and attitude over matter. Okay? What's this? Imagination helps provide meaning to experience and understanding to knowledge. It is a fundamental facility through which people make sense of the world and it also plays a key role in the learning process. A basic training for imagination is listening to storytelling narrative books in which the exactness of the chosen words is the fundamental factor to evoke worlds. Imagination is the faculty through which we encounter everything. The things that we touch. Now, this is from the secular world. This is not scripture. But isn't it amazing what they have studied out is backed up in the word. Whatever a man thinks in his heart, that's what he becomes. And James said, your tongue, your language is like a rudder on a ship. No matter how big the ship is, that little rudder will take it where, it wants, where it's turned to. The things we touch, see, and hear vividly produce a picture in our imagination. It is accepted as the innate ability and process of inventing partial or complete personal realms within the mind from elements derived from the sense perceptions of the shared world. I'll give you the Oklahoma translation in just a minute. The term is technically used. Imagination or imagery is technically used in psychology for the process of reviving in the mind precepts of objects formerly given in the sense perception. Since this use of the term conflicts with what the or of ordinary language, some psychologists have preferred to describe this process as imaging or imagery or to speak of it as reproductive or productive ability. Imagination can also be expressed through stories such as fairy tales or fantasies, 
most famous inventions or entertainment products were created from the inspiration of someone's imagination. Follow me, church. We all just want to form something in the earth, but it can't be formed until you imagine it first. And you can't imagine it until you dwell upon his thoughts to derive his mental disposition. All three must bear witness. Okay. Our hypothesis for this evolution of human imagination is that it allowed conscious beings to solve problems and hence increase individual survival fitness by use of mental simulation. Now watch this. Imagination differs fundamentally from belief because the subject understands that what is personally invented by the mind does not necessarily impact the course of action taken in the apparently shared world while beliefs are part of what one holds as truths about both the shared and personal worlds. The play of imagination, apart from the obvious limitations, is conditioned only by the general trend of the mind at a given moment. Let me retranslate it. You can only imagine from the mindset you live in. Now do you see why Paul said in Romans 12, 1, 2, 3, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present everything that's got your name on it as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, and don't be conformed to this world. Psychologists are talking. There's two worlds now. He said, don't be conformed to what you see, hear, smell, feel, and taste, poverty, diseases, death, curses, and lack, but be you transformed by renewing your mind to the other world. It means think like God. Think righteous to believe because you'll never expect what you don't believe you deserve. So you've got to start learning. I am the righteousness of God. I am not a sinner. I am saved by faith through His grace. I am not my own anymore. I've been bought with a price. I am the elect of Almighty God. I am an inheritor of the covenant. I have His position. I have His possession. I walk in His privilege. I am what He says I am. And I begin to renew my mind to that then in my quiet hours when thoughts pass my mind, I begin to collect them as seeds and water them with my time. And all of a sudden, I start seeing myself heal. Oh my God. I start imagining I'm out of debt. Oh my Lord. Now I'm not having to get in a prayer line to get out of debt because I'm using my creative ability of imagery just like God did. Let's create man. Now let's form him from what we imagined. You can only form what you imagine. Nothing less and nothing more. If you can't see yourself healed in your imagination, you'll never walk in your healing in the natural. Thank you, this is good. I may buy this CD. Amen. What's this? I, 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 I won't hold you much longer in this, but this, for me, it's very intriguing. I don't like people just blurting out in a hyperactive message that everybody knows. I want you to sit and listen to the process of walking in an open heaven. Okay? Imagination. They have discovered. Imagination, because of having freedom from external limitations, can often become a source of real pleasure or unnecessary suffering. A person of vivid imagination can often suffer acutely from the imagined perils besetting friends, relatives, or even strangers such as celebrities also, crippling fear can result from taking an imagined painful future too seriously. Oh, my Lord. 
Imagination can also produce some symptoms of real Ill illnesses. In some cases, they can seem so real that specific physical manifestations occur, such as rashes and bruises appearing on the skin as though imagination passed into belief. Oh, oh, <laughs> there we go. We've got people trying to believe for healing and they haven't even imagined it yet. You can't believe in what you haven't imagined. My God, you're getting some answers here tonight. You can't even believe it. You can say, I believe in healing, but unless you've imagined it, you'll never form it. Now do you see why we need to speak with other tongues? Because even though I'm saved, I had years of being in this world. Now I'm having to relearn I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I live according to a new imagery now. I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith in the Son of God. They say cancer. I say life. They say death. I say you'll not die in your own blood. They say broke, impoverished. I say I'm the lender and not the borrower. I've got two worlds at war. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am. The things I shouldn't do, that's what I do. He said, I'm just in conflict here. But I thank God through Jesus Christ. Jesus came to open the heavens so you living in a natural world could form a spiritual imagery by the spoken word. You can't believe in what you can't imagine. And you can't imagine what you can't believe. Amen. You can get in every prayer line you want, bring your prophecy book with you, get all the oil from Jerusalem freshly beaten, poured over you, and all you'll do is look like you're smart wearing vitalis. It ain't going to work. You've got to figure out, man, thank God for ministers and prophetic words, but if I was the only one on this planet, He still came for me. And I will produce what He said is mine. So I'm going to set my heart, like David said, as a flint toward heaven. I've got all these thoughts running through my head, but I know what is His thoughts. And I choose to meditate upon these things. When Paul said, think on these things, he was saying, think on them until you can get an image of them. And when you get an image, watch this, let the spirit, the blood, and the water bear witness. My disposition is, I don't have to be sick. My disposition is, I don't have to be broke. My disposition is, I ain't living or dying with cancer. That's my disposition. Well, how do you know it's going to work? Because it's truth. And it's of a world. See, the unbeliever can't understand our world. They shouldn't be able to comprehend our world. Jesus said that. What communion does light have with darkness? If the believer can understand you, you're not living in an open heaven. Because you're talking like they talk. How you doing? I'm just waiting on Jesus to come. Matter of fact, sing that I'll fly away. Just not in my presence. Hello. See, you've got to get, I hope this is helping you. Because the enemy, I want you to walk out of this building tonight with your head held high and a new hope in your heart that when you lay your head on the pillow tonight, you are making up your mind. I will not allow the enemy to produce a false imagery in me anymore. I am the righteousness of God. I am entitled to health and life and abundance. I am the head and not the tail. I have been guaranteed to be blessed coming in and going out. Coming in and going out of what? Coming into this world and going out of this world. I have been chosen to be the blessed. And I'm forming an imagery of that. And my words are forming it from the earth. Imagine 
but you've got to first believe. Amen. Man, I gotta, oh, I gotta hurry. What's this? Simply stated, thoughts are suggestions that when dwelt upon began to build a supernatural energy called imagination. When you have imagined something, you have already created it. Let us create man in, by, and because of our image. God, let's get some revelation on this tonight. Let's create man by our imagery. So what's this? The minute he imagined you, he created you. You were, more, you were just as alive when he imagined you as when he formed you. Yeah. The minute you imagined yourself with a clean bill of health, Amen. it became. Right. No, you got to see that. Well, I don't see it in the earth. It's because you haven't formed it yet. Right. Oh, my God. You're already healed and don't know it. It's the energy. You are so much like God. That's your God likeness. Let us create man in our likeness. What is his likeness? The ability to image anything and produce it. Therefore, I think it not robbery to be equal with God. If that offends you, you don't know who you are yet. Somebody say equal. That word equal in Philippians 2, 5, 6, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What is the mind? It is the world of the spirit where thoughts come and go, but you, unlike every other creation, have the right to choose which ones you dwell on and form an image. Amen. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Somebody say equal. You know this. That word means same position, not the same person. You have the same ability as God to imagine something and then form it. What are you saying, Mark? The spiritual principle is this. You can't complain about what you tolerate. And you are tolerating it if you're imagining it. Paul said, cast down imaginations. I mean, the minute something comes up, I cast, that's not of God, that's of the other world. I'm trying to live in victory in two worlds. I've got a natural sens sensational world telling me to go by how I feel, what I smell, what I see, what I hear, what I taste. But I've got a spiritual world that says, everything about you is victorious. Now, I'm, I'm having to make a choice. Which thoughts am I going to meditate on to produce an image? Oh, I've got to hurry. The earth and your whole life is the result of your imaginations. Hello? The earth and your whole life is the result of your imaginations. Remember, these three must bear witness. Your attitude, your words, and your actions must all be in agreement. That means you've got to get your imaginations lined up with His truth, get your belief system in that area, start walking in it, start talking in it. What are you doing? You're forming what you're imagining. Man, I hope you're getting this tonight. Everyone has the ability and the right to imagine. Jesus paid for the right to imagine victory. So if you imagine yourself losing, dying sick, or any calamity being a part of your lifestyle, you are saying, and I know you don't mean to, but you are indirectly saying, thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the price, but you really shouldn't have. 
because I choose to live in defeat no matter what you did to change my image. And nobody in their right mind would say that. But we live that way when we talk negative, talk pessimistic, hello, and live according to the five senses. I've got to show you this quick and then we'll go. Are we having food tonight? Food tonight, amen. Food. Food. James 3rd chapter. Say it with me. The blood, the word, and the spirit. My life, my attitude, and my words must line up with who he says I am. I will then live my life in the open heaven. Where did I tell you to go? James 3? Okay, James the third chapter. <laughs> I love smoking cows. James 3. Look what James said in the first verse. I'm reading from the New King Jimmy translation. Yours say pretty much the same. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word... If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a mature man able to bridle the whole body. Oh, 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 there we go. So the blood, the spirit, and the word all bear agreement. So you, you say, well, I've got the right attitude. I, I've got the right actions. But what you say is the reflection whether your life is in agreement. Do you see that? Keep on reading. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they're so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue. Somebody say language. That should have been the word translated there because we say tongue and we just think literally the tongue. No, it's language. What is your language comprised of? your attitude, your actions, and your words. Even so, the language seems so insignificant. So, so what I've got a bad attitude about it? So what I did that or did this or said this or that? Even though it's a little member and boasts great things, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue, somebody say the language... Let me retranslate it now that we know what the tongue is. It's the language of attitude, words, and lifestyle. So the lifestyle is a fire. So the words you speak can become a fire. So the attitude you have can become a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire fire by hell. Now look at me just a minute. Let's go to school. I'm going to give this to you quick. Just enough to make you study. Matthew the third chapter, the tenth verse. Matthew three. Somebody say hell and fire. Now I think that's what we used to preach years ago in church to scare the bejeebies out of people to get them saved. We'd scare people with hell to get them saved. That's wrong. Jesus never did it. He never did it. No, he did So, uh, Matthew, the third chapter, Jesus says this, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Oh, wait, the trees. I think he said that in Isaiah, too. He said, I'm going to plant you like trees. Your days are going to be like the trees. So he's talking about a mentality of people, okay? It's a spiritual book. Let's understand. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. How many times growing up in church did I hear preachers red in the face, spitting and meaning it from their hearts sincerely, just not having an understanding. If you don't start living right, God's going to cut you off and He'll throw you into hell. 
How many was raised in church? Okay, let's smoke a cow. Somebody say hell. The word hell means a gorge, a tight place, high walls as a valley, a place of frustration and hopelessness, a place where your passion never produces. The hell James was talking about and the hell Jesus was talking about in Matthew 3.10 had nothing to do with flames. <gasps> Who was he talking to anyway? The church. He's not scaring the church with hell. He's trying to get them to understand your tongue. Somebody say tongue. Your tongue, James said, is like a fire. Somebody say fire. That word fire in the Greek language means lightning. Oh my God. He said when you speak, you are starting the fire of the hell you're going to go through. He wasn't talking about sending people to a pit of hell. He was trying to warn them. Be careful the mentality you have because it's going to produce images you don't want to live through. It's going to be hell for you, a place of hopelessness, hopelessness where your passion never produces. He was warning them about their imagery, not trying to scare the hell out of them. I'm sick of stupid preachers trying to scare people with flames instead of Tell them about the goodness of God. I'm sick of it. There's nothing worse than a stupid preacher. Why? Because every seed reproduces after its kind. You plant corn, what do you get? You plant wheat, what do you get? Stupid preacher teaches you, what do you get? Stupid people. And I say stupid because you can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorant. Ignorant means they didn't know. But they hear something different and something, well, by God, this is all I've ever taught. Well, then get a job. Go do something else because you've got people living and dying with curses that aren't supposed to. Are you hearing me? The hell I go through is the lightning fire my tongue started. And the reason my tongue started a fire of hell I shouldn't have ever had to go through is because I was living in the wrong world, imagining the wrong thing. Are you here? He didn't save you just so you don't have to go to hell. He saved you and said, now you're in my family. You can think healthy now. You can think blessed and prosperous now. Don't start a fire that's going to end up in your hell. I got to quit. Well, I hope he does because he done made me mad tonight. <laughs> well, I hope I hadn't made you mad. Can I give you a retranslation of Matthew 3.10? I've come to show you a new mindset and disposition of an open heaven. And every person who does not operate in the language of the righteous by redemption will be frustrated and turned over to the passions and fires that their language started. Be careful what hell you produce. Well, I'll never get out of this. Enjoy hell. Well, it's never going to get better. No. Well, I just need a miracle. No. Because hear me. Everything he did was to be an example. And God created it by his image and then he formed it with his word amen so living in an open heaven is getting my attitude according to the spirit world my lifestyle according to the spirit world and my words according to the spirit world now I ask you if God be for you who can be against you we live in this world but our imagery is from another world so, let me close. James, for the third time. James, the third chapter. The eighth verse. No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, do you know why the Holy Spirit came in you? 
because we couldn't control what we imagined. That's the reason everybody needs a prayer language. Oh, there's that talking in tongues stuff. Yeah, everybody needs it. Well, well, Mark, Jesus didn't talk in tongues. Well, he never sinned. Hello. Well, I've seen some people talk in tongues and they act goofy. I agree. If there's any nuts in the cereal box, it's in spirit-filled movements. I'll guarantee you. We got some fruit loops. No, I mean, some people just go goofy with it, okay? But it doesn't mean you don't need it. Just because you drive your car into a bridge and kill yourself doesn't mean I'm not going to buy a car. Just because some people get goofy with tongues doesn't mean you don't need it. Hello? Why do I need to speak with other tongues? Because I'm in this sense-filled world. And I'm hearing all these thoughts. And the enemy's trying to get me to dwell on them to produce an imagination because he knows my creative ability. So when all these things I'm seeing, I'm feeling, I'm hearing, what do I do? What are you doing? I'm taming the tongue. Man can't do it, but God can. Amen. So I challenge you. I hope you've had a good word fest. I challenge you, don't go through hell. It's so unnecessary. It's so unnecessary. Be careful what fires your tongue starts. But remember, it's not just about what you say. It's about what you dwell on. Imagine yourself in the blessings. Would you stand?